If it's Tuesday, voters are voting and they're not happy. We got some new numbers suggesting America is in the depths of a political depression as seven more states hold their midterm primaries tonight. What you need to know, why it matters in just a moment. Plus, President Biden meets with the Senate's top gun reform negotiator on the Democratic side as actor and Uvalde native Matthew McConaughey urges action from the White House podium in an extraordinarily compelling appearance. And mass shooting survivors and victims' family members head and speak on Capitol Hill. And members of the Proud Boys charged with seditious conspiracy, what it means for this far-right extremist group and for extremism in America, a year and a half after the Capitol insurrection. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd, and thanks for streaming with us. As we say around here, if it's Tuesday, voters are voting somewhere. And today, that somewhere is a group of seven states from coast to coast, New Jersey to California, plus Mississippi, Montana, New Mexico, and Iowa and South Dakota. And the one with the most races we're watching the closest is our friends in California. What happens in California tonight could give us some clues about the directions of both parties, including how voters in the nation's most progressive state are feeling these days about issues like crime, homelessness, and inflation in two of its biggest cities. But whether voters across the country make their voices heard tonight at the ballot box or whether they send an even more powerful message by staying home, we have some flashing red sirens to start the show with today. Signs that America could be in the midst of a big political depression. Check out these numbers from Pew. Nearly two-thirds of Republicans and Democrats, something they actually agree on, say that all or most people who run for office do so because they want to serve their own personal interests. Democrats and Republicans, as I said, don't agree on much these days, but they seem to agree on that. Just 21 percent, basically one in five Americans, think that all or most candidates who run for office do so because they want to serve their community. Just 20 percent of the country thinks that about anybody running for elective office. Add that cynicism to our latest NBC poll that shows 75 percent of the country believing we're on the wrong track, and you've got an angry, disinterested electorate that's hostile to most folks with a title like congressman or congresswoman in front of their name. And on the campaign trail, the word politician itself is being used as an epitaph. Check out these ads. Illegal immigration is bringing in drugs and crime, taking jobs South Carolinians need. And career politician Russell Fry hasn't done enough to protect our borders. Eight times in a row, politician Greg Raths increased our tax rates and fees. Just like Biden and the liberals, Raths makes California unaffordable. We pay more, he makes more. That's politician Greg Raths. Politician or career politician kind of a four-letter word of sorts. It's important to note both those ads are for the incumbents in their respective House races. They're attacking, yes, politicians. Look, there's a saying at one of the newspapers here in Washington, democracy dies in darkness. But you can just as easily say that democracy dies in apathy. And if people believe that the concept of public service is a myth, and they let that cynicism, their cynicism toward government, keep them home on election days, where they could ostensibly elect quality lawmakers, we're headed to a bad place. And frankly, we got a poignant reminder of that sense of frustration voters are feeling at the White House podium this afternoon when actor and Uvalde native Matthew McConaughey vented his frustration on the inaction to pass gun legislation. We've got to take a sober, humble, and honest look in the mirror and rebrand re ourselves based on what we truly value. What we truly value. We've got to get some real courage and honor our immortal obligations instead of our party affiliations. Enough with the counterpunching. Enough with the invalidation of the other side. Let's come to the common table that represents the American people. Find a middle, middle ground, the place where most of us Americans live anyway. Jacob Ward is in San Francisco for us today. Voters may oust their progressive district attorney after criticism that he's been too soft on crime. He's also covering a couple of interesting races in the southern part of the state as well. And also with us is the Des Moines Register's Brianne Fannin-Steel. She's following a Senate primary in Iowa that's got its share of anti-politician campaigning, if you will. But, Jacob, let me start with you because the, the most uh, likely 
uh, sort of anti-politician result we may see delivered tonight is this recall in San Francisco. And of course, this isn't even the first recall of this uh, calendar year in San Francisco. That's absolutely right. We saw, Chuck, you know, we spoke uh, months ago about the recall of three school board members here in San Francisco accused of basically being incompetent uh, at their job. But it became this big political question for the whole nation. Is progressive politics in trouble? Here we're looking at a very similar question for the nation, but a very different set of circumstances. Basically, the city by the bay, as you know, is this incredible liberal bastion, and it swept D.A. Chesa Boudin into office on his progressive ideas about how to change what he called the culture of mass incarceration. He was going to stop trying juveniles as adults. He was going to stop doing all of that. You had, you know, this this big shift that he promised. But now, not even two years into his term, he is up for recall. We asked him, you know, what the national stakes might be if he, a progressive reformer, is pulled out of office. Here's how he described what's at stake. in very similar circumstances all across uh, the country, Philadelphia and Chicago and Los Angeles. And the Republicans, the police unions are making every effort to undermine the ability of progressive reformers to actually get the job done. They can't win at the ballot box when they go head to head. And so now they're trying to create electoral opportunities where they don't actually have to tell voters what their platform is, what their policies are, even who their candidates are. Now, the truth of the matter here, Chuck, is that San Francisco is a vastly safer city than most other cities its size. Mm -hmm. You compare it to other places, and its violent crime rates per capita are very low. But as you know, that doesn't matter. It is the perception of crime. And people we speak to here talk about seeing people sleeping on the streets. That is not, of course, illegal, but the tide of addiction, right. homelessness, and a certain drumbeat of crime, and especially auto theft and burglaries, all of that has people very frustrated here. And D.A. Boudin is really at pains, as are Democrats across the country, to explain how it is he's going to fight crime while pursuing these long-term progressive goals, Chuck. Look, it's the specific of homelessness that feels like ties San, the story in San Francisco with the story in Los Angeles. The rise of Rick Caruso, a developer who's sort of running from, I guess, the middle, if you will, Karen Bass, uh, a more traditional liberal politician. It seems like that issue is what's also finding traction down there, yes? That's absolutely right. In Los Angeles, uh, billionaire real estate mogul Rick Caruso essentially making it one of the core campaign promises that he will add another thousand police officers to already a vast force in Los Angeles, making it the biggest police force in its in the city's history if he goes forward with that. Meanwhile, Karen Bass, who's well known as a representative uh, of, of the black and Latino communities in, in South Central and all, you know, just a really well known yeah. community person there. She says she'll instead put 250 clerical workers to work so she can free up the time of the police. In both cases, they're having to talk about crime because crime is up in Los Angeles, as it is here in, in San Francisco. So uh, really, those are the top of mind issues at a time when we thought we were coming into a very progressive period after right. the summer of George Floyd and the rest of it. So very interesting to see how all of this is changing across the nation. And there's no doubt. It does feel like the city races in some ways are trumping the state and congressional congressional races, which we're going to touch on in a few minutes as well, uh, at least in California. Jacob Ward, terrific reporting there for us. Let me move over to the central part of the country uh, where we find Brianne Fan and Steele. And if there is a marquee statewide race tonight, it is this Democratic primary for the U.S. Senate nomination in Iowa. Look, we're not sure if national Democrats take, you know, how much they're going to invest in this race. But it is interesting to me to see somebody whose first name is Congresswoman, in this case, former Congresswoman Abby Finkenauer, who looked like she was going to, it was basically going to be handed to her. Uh, is she going to blow this? That's a great question. You know, she came into this race, as you mentioned, really looking like the front runner. She uh, she raised a lot of money to start. She came in with some big endorsements. She has been to Congress. Um, but here in the last couple of weeks, there's a lot of momentum around another Democrat running, former uh, retired Navy Admiral Mike Franken, who, um, who came back to Iowa to run for the U.S. Senate. He's drawing a lot of enthusiasm. He's really making a play for the middle in Iowa for a lot of independent 
independent voters, for some disillusioned Republican voters. Um, and, you know, looking back, Abby Finkenauer really struggled to even get on the ballot in Iowa. It was a big moment. Mm. She struggled to get the necessary signatures that she needed. It ended up in the state Supreme Court. So that really damaged her uh, her perception, I think, in a lot of circles, especially among Democratic activists who who saw that as a as a major mistake. So tonight we'll see whether she's yeah. able to pull it out. Look, it's uh, I, I, look, it's going to be a close game. You know, if you're looking for an election to follow that may take to the 70 uh, or 80 percent reporting, this is one of them. Let's talk about Chuck Grassley, because um, you told you told us uh, before the show began a stat that I, I thought I knew every stat. But this is the first time Chuck Grassley's ever had a primary opponent. Is that right? This is his first. This is his first primary in a Senate race since 1980. He's seeking wow. an eighth term. You talk about an incumbent, right? He's been in federal office for 47 years, and and he has not faced a primary challenge since that very first run for the U.S. Senate in 1980. He's got a state senator, Jim Carlin, who's running to his right here in Iowa, and so that's pretty unusual. Chuck Grassley, um, you know, his longevity in Iowa. He's he's a legend here. He's a political icon. People really look to him, and so for him to be facing this challenge. I think, you know, nobody's too concerned about him being being beaten. I think he'll win this pretty handily tonight. Um, but we're all going to be looking here in Iowa to see just how much of, of the vote Jim Carlin is able to pull, where he's able to right. pull from, because I think people see Chuck Grassley as being weaker than he has been in some of his past elections. Look, this is, there has been some speculation here in Washington, Brian, that, that, you know, had Grassley been able to make sure he was going to be replaced by somebody from the mainstream wing of the party, he wouldn't be running. But he's running essentially to hold off the far right in Iowa. Uh, is, is that the sense you get on the ground? I think that's I think Chuck Grassley is running because he thinks he can do a good job, and this is something that he wants to do. Um, but but you're exactly right that if he hadn't, it would have opened a really wide, wide open primary here in Iowa. And who knows um, who would have stepped in for that? I think Iowa certainly is still Donald Trump country. There are certain members of mm -hmm. the party, like Jim Carlin, who believe that Chuck Grassley should not have voted to certify the 2020 election, um, and that that could really be um, detrimental, possibly, to the party in the long term. To see um, some of that infighting maybe that would have happened if this had been an open seat. We shall see, Brianne uh, Fennestiel. Uh, thank you so much. Enjoy election night in Iowa. Before that, Jacob Ward with the latest out of California. So joining me now in set, dig in a little bit more, Leanne Caldwell, Washington Post Live anchor, co-author of The Early 202, Stephen Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch, and Simone Sanders, former Kamala Harris senior advisor and host of Simone on MSNBC. Um, Leanne, I want to start biggest picture of all this to me that one in five Americans believe, only one in five Americans believe people run for office for the greater good. Mm -hmm. That we are, look, as a, as a journalist who's been here 30 years and can have some cynicism in them, it's like, yeah, they're probably right. Mm -hmm. But ouch. Yeah, that's bad. And I, I, well, let's stick to the politics, but also these talks on gun mm -hmm. control legislation, or I won't even call it gun legislation because that's not really what it is, but these tinkering around the edges yeah. is probably going to play into that as well. There's been a major distrust of institutions over the last decade, at least, probably longer. It got worse during the Trump administration. People voted in 2020 against the former president, against Donald Trump. Um, not necessarily for President Biden. And they're not seeing a lot of change yeah. in the pocketbook. They're not seeing a lot of change, uh, good things happen for them. And so I think that there is just a lot of apathy out there. And we're seeing that in these elections. Look, I'm not somebody who wants, to, who, who, you know, runs to when Hollywood celebrities make, make a point. But I got to play this other side for Matthew McConaughey today, because I actually think he didn't, whether he meant to speak to this point that we were making this morning and we made today, it certainly sounded like it's Stephen Simone. Take a listen. People in power have failed to act. So we're asking you, and I'm asking you, will you please ask yourselves, can both sides rise above? Can both sides see beyond the political problem at hand and admit that we have a life preservation problem on our hands? So we've got a chance right now to reach for and to grasp a higher ground above our political affiliations. A chance to make a choice that does more than protect your party. A chance to make a choice that protects our country now and for the next generation. Aww. 
It's hard to disagree with anything he said there, Simone. I can't disagree. And you know what? Matthew McConaughey is not some blazing liberal, right? You know, he describes himself as a, a centrist. Again, okay? what, what that means, like a Felt like a radical centrist there. Aggressive. Yeah. He's, he sometimes says uh, aggressive centrist. Yeah. Um, he is a gun owner. It is it, Matthew McConaughey was saying what I think a lot of people around the country are saying. Well, why can't the politicians do something? And um, I was I was having a conversation with another one of our colleagues earlier today, talking about the fact that okay. Th it seems to be seems to me that incremental progress in Washington and Congress is going to happen when it comes to some type of legislation, as Leanne talked about. Um, it's really hard to look at voters, look at the American people, look at parents who's, who lost their kids in Uvalde, look at uh, uh, Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield Jr., who lost his mother in Buffalo, and tell them that this incremental progress is something you should be happy about. Everyone believes that we should be able to do something. And if not, why are these people in Congress in the first place? And I do think that they have a point. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, I mean, think back to uh, 2006. It was the first of a long string of change elections. I mean, we have every change election between 2006 and 2020, now certainly 20. We've only had one in that era that one was not that a was change. One that was not, and it was 2012. 12. Yeah. Every other one was a change election. And that just tells you the voters have had it. They are fed up. They can't stand it anybody. I mean, I, I have to say that when you raised that 65 percent number, wasn't surprising at all. No, In no, some ways, right. it was surprised that it was as low as it was, which is really, I mean, maybe I'm too cynical. It's possible. But that's an amazing statement. I think you look at whether you're talking about gun legislation, the ability to, to even have a conversation, oh. right? I mean, mm -hmm. Maybe these conversations are taking place behind the scenes. I imagine that we probably would end up in different places on what the right policy outcome is. But the inability to have a conversation about it is Look what striking. happened to the Buffalo congressman. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, he it's just, crazy. He lost he, all the endorsements. He the just wanted to have a conversation. He can't even raise something that's seen as a heterodox view in the current party structure. Let me tell you, and this is why young people, though, are very disaffected with the political system mm -hmm. as it currently is. It's not that they aren't participating. Young people are very engaged and involved at various levels, but they do not see politics through as the vehicle through which they can make change. It's not a solution. It's not a solution yeah. for them. And we have to get to a place where young people believe in this system. And politicians aren't governing for solutions. They're governing or they're campaigning on the base of the yeah. party. Well, on both they're, sides. they're governing for survival. Stay and I were talking yeah. about this. Yep. It's sort of fused together. Right. Yeah. No, it's an excellent point. And the bases of the party, when you go to the far right or the far left, they're not the ones who are actually doing anything. And that gets back to the apathy, why people aren't engaged or these change elections. People, as you said, have had it is because people aren't seeing anything that impacts them. There's chaos. It swings mm -hmm. back and forth and people are frustrated. Look, I want to get to another piece of that makes people cynicism. You, you and I were talking about this. Earlier. David Valadeo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. The fact that Democrats are running an ad to promote an opponent of Valadeo from the far right huh. because Valadeo did the right thing about Trump yeah. and, and voted to impeach. It, 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 you, had a, you were pretty impassioned about this. White hot rage about this. I mean, look, I'm actually sympathetic. I don't agree with Democrats on a lot of things. I'm very sympathetic to Democrats when they say, the, the stuff about stolen elections, election integrity, that is the core of what we're doing as a country. It is integral to democracy, to the preservation of the republic. And it could be an existential issue. I buy it. I agree with them. I nod my head along when people like Nancy Pelosi say that. And then Democrats go and spend to boost a candidate like this against David Valadeo, who took a really risky mm -hmm. political vote by voting in favor of impeachment. If you want people to do the right thing, you have to reward them when you do the right yeah, thing. We and do this is so cynical. Mm -hmm. So I understand the, the political hardball element, and I'm not naive about it. I yeah. don't, though. But I'm, it is I'm with so you. cynical. Like, come Tell me, on. Simone. I don't. Look, I think as a, I, I was a Democratic strategist for a very long time, I've worked a lot of races. Do you have to be willing? There has to be a line that you are unwilling yeah. to cross. That you are, that there has to be a line that you are so not you think willing that attack, to cross. Pay, Democrats paying for that ad was a mistake. I don't think it was necessary. Yeah. There are many other battles that Democrats can fight this, this midterm election season. Yeah, lots of battles, and some that they can win. If we say that we believe that we need two political parties in this country, mm -hmm. if we say that we believe we need Republicans who are willing to stand up and do the right thing, then when Republicans do that, let's, let, let's not target them and pick on them. Let them do the right thing in hopes that they'll come back the next time. I think that we're playing a very dangerous game, and this is why people don't believe in the system, because yeah, exactly. they're like, look at what these, these politicians are doing. Leanne, you spend more time in the hell than, than all of us here. 
um, with your last job here and, and what you're doing now. It, mm -hmm. Is any of, do you see any impact? Are we getting the, the typical, oh, well, I wish I could do more, but I can't type of whisper conversations? Yeah, I mean, on guns or everything? On the whole, on the whole thing, obviously guns being the latest of, right. this, of these issues. But January 6th is, right, feels like in the same category in an odd way, you know? Yeah, yes and no. I think that people are so politically hardened. We're so close to an election. I, there is just no... There's no meeting across the aisle anymore, um, even privately anymore. Everything is every, battle. People have like, you know, our, political language is so violent, and it's it, there's a reason for that. And it's in these discussions of gun debates, it's been I've been catching myself about the violent language that I've been using about how to describe the two parties mm -hmm. against each other. But you know, I was talking to Senator Kramer of uh, North Dakota earlier today about the gun legislation, and he is just. You know, we are the freest country in the world, and so this is, you know, we can't take away these freedoms. And I asked him, and I said, well, President Biden's response to that is people need to feel free to go to the grocery store, to go mm -hmm. to schools, to be able to live their lives and feel safe. And and he says, well, that he, he just completely disagreed. He said, we can't take away people's freedoms. That's the choice that we have to make. And so oh, people God. are still really, really hardened on a lot of these issues. And and that's why on this gun debate specifically, you know, Senator Cornyn is leading this, but he is there to make sure that any sort of changes happen are very small, very incremental, very, very This is narrow. designed to get 25 Republican votes, this is right? Designed, Not 10. And, and, and what that does yeah. when you have 25 Republican votes, that means that there's not going to be any, there, nothing is going to be sweeping. It's going to be, they're now saying we need to improve the current laws. Something better than nothing, though, in this case? For the United States Congress, yes, but this is just not on Congress. This is also on state legislatures and governors yeah. across the country. In the aftermath of Parkland, in Florida, when Rick Scott was governor, okay, a real Republican, legislation got passed that did something yeah. in a Republican state legislature. Will something be addictive? Something beget yeah, look, something? I, I, think it's, I think it's good to have some progress on, on any of this. And again, I think we probably would end up in different places yeah. on what the, what the specifics are, but it, it's it's good to have some progress. It's good to have them talking, at least. And if you look back on the, the big things that Congress has tried to do, whether it's comprehensive immigration reform, whether it's gun legislation, it's not working. So yeah. take, take what you can get. Yeah, and there's none of this, hey, we both have something tough that we have to sell our bases, so let's all do this together. Right. But that is so out the window. Right. <laughs> we right. don't do those things anymore. <laughs> uh, Simone, Stephen, Leanne, nice to see you. We miss nice you over you. here. Thank you. All right. Miss you guys. Come up. Coming up, we're going to dive into more of the gun debate and the gun violence epidemic in America with the mayor of St. Louis. No stranger to this issue, she once said that she and her son would, quote, fall asleep to a lullaby of gunshots every night. And as we go to break, I want to play a bit more of what actor and Evalde native Matthew McConaughey did at the White House press briefing this afternoon. He gave some eulogies of the victims. They were pretty powerful. Take a listen. My day wore green high-top converse with a heart she had hand-drawn on the right toe because they represented her love of nature. Camilla's got these shoes. Can you show these shoes, please? Wore these every day. Green converse with a heart on the right toe. These are the same green converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her after the shooting. How about that? Welcome back. And as you could tell, it's already been a busy day at both ends of Capitol Hill uh, on efforts to get a deal on new gun legislation. Look how much we spent our primary coverage talking about gun legislation. You just heard Matthew McConaughey making his own emotional push for gun reform at the start of the White House daily briefing. But he's actually been going all around uh, Senate offices doing the same thing. Chris Murphy, by the way, the lead Democrat uh, negotiator in the Senate on getting a bipartisan deal on this met with President Biden at the White House earlier today. The president has made his own demands for what the package should include, but Murphy seemed to urge the Biden administration to stay out of the Senate talks for now. So we had a good, uh, good conversation. Obviously, we still got work to do in the Senate. Um, I'm grateful that the White House is giving uh, us the space necessary to get it. 
Meanwhile, tomorrow, the House Oversight Committee will hold a hearing on gun violence with testimony from a fourth grader who survived the Robb Elementary School shooting in Ovalde, Texas. And today, the Senate Judiciary Committee heard from the son of a victim of last month's shooting at Buffalo as part of a hearing about the rise of white supremacy. So what are we supposed to do with all our anger and all of our pain? Do you expect us to continue to just forgive and forget over and over again? And what are you doing? You're elected to protect us, to protect our way of life. I ask every one of you to imagine the faces of your mothers as you look at mine and ask yourself, is there nothing that we can do? Let's check in with our senior Capitol Hill correspondent, Garrett Haig, uh, who's been covering these hearings. Also with me, Carol Lee, who covers the White House for NBC News. So, Garrett, let me start with what we heard today on the Hill. I have to tell you, it, it's actually hearing uh, from Mr. Whitfield there, hearing from Matthew McConaughey. We're hearing the same thing. Do something. Don't just sit on your hands. How close are yeah, we? Look well, I think that um, those emotional appeals do have some value here, Chuck, because as you know, every time we start down this road after a mass shooting, it's usually some other event in the national consciousness that kind of breaks the moment aside and gives lawmakers an excuse to walk away. And these emotional moments, be they from McConaughey, be they from the witness today, or potentially tomorrow when we're going to have uh, family members uh, from both Uvalde and Buffalo uh, testifying on the House side, that keeps this issue in the headlines and it keeps it emotionally resonant for the negotiators. Now, you've got, you know, John Cornyn and Chris Murphy who've both been going out of their way to praise each other as, you know, good faith actors and all this. You got the Chris Murphy brushback pitch there to the White House saying, mm -hmm. let us work here. So I do think there's probably a Goldilocks area here where a certain amount of emotional resonance, a certain amount of outside pressure from the country might be useful to keep minds focused. But outside political pressure is probably not necessary and could even be counterproductive at this stage. And Garrett, it, you know, the assumption appears to be that Cornyn is not trying to find 10 votes, that Cornyn's job is to, is to do something that 20 to essentially get a deal that Mitch McConnell could vote for. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, and it probably comes with a cost, too, and we're seeing that as these negotiations play out. Democrats aren't going to get, you know, even mansion to me levels of expansion of background checks, let alone universal background checks. That gets you two or three Republican votes, maybe, but it certainly doesn't get you 10, and it doesn't get you 15 or 20. I mean, look, John Cornyn's right in the, the ideological center of the Republican conference. He's not somebody who's super Trumpy. He's not also Susan Collins or yeah, Lisa Murkowski or, anti, or somebody yeah. who works with Democrats on a lot of other issues, but he is somebody who knows how to find some consensus when he wants to. And if you get corn, and yeah, you might get 14 Republicans to the ideological left of him on this issue. And that's a big win, you know, potentially for the legislation, depending on what's in it. And it could be one for Republicans who would be able to, you know, in their mind, perhaps even neutralize this as a political issue by saying, look at the degree to which we are working on something that the country says we got to get to work on. Look, uh, we saw Mitch McConnell deputize others that successfully found ways to do this. Rob Portman on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. He cut a deal. They got 20. Tim Scott was supposed to do the same thing and he didn't. He walked away unless he could get a deal that could get 20 the, votes the of police reform. We see what they do. The Tim Scott example here is, I think, what Democrats are worried about, right? right? Like, Tim Scott cared more about police reform than any other Republican senator. And so if you didn't have Tim Scott in the room, you didn't have a deal. Right. And Tim Scott didn't get there. And there's still blame going back and forth between he and Cory Booker and uh, mayoral candidate Karen Bass over whose fault that was. Um, and, and Cornyn plays a similar role here, because if Cornyn walks away from the table, that's it. That's I mean, it. the path right. to 60 is, is over. Right. So he's the indispensable man here for Democrats whether they like it or not. Carol Lee, the role of the White House here, uh, they did the speech, which in hindsight, did it, did it matter? Has it had an impact? Nothing he's called for is in these talks. Chris Murphy is now saying, hey, stay out of, stay out of this for now. Uh, Garrett called it a bit of a, of a polite brushback pitch. Mm -hmm. um, what does the White House want to get out of this? Yeah, Chuck, the word that everyone's using is space. We heard from the White House Press Secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre, just moments ago saying, we're ready to give them space. We'll give them the space they need, repeatedly saying, we're going to give them space. We heard from Senator Murphy that they want the space to make this happen. I think when it comes to the president's speech last week, he laid down a marker. He made clear he seized a moment 
for the history books, essentially saying, this is what I would really like to see done. But he also did something pretty critical, which is say, but I'm willing to go here, meaning dial things back. And one of the things that we're hearing from the White House today after his meeting with Senator Murphy is Corinne Jean-Pierre was asked, you know, would the president sign whatever Senator Murphy negotiates? Now, she dodged that and said, I'm not going to negotiate from here. But she did say there are two things that the president is likes and that is and supports red flag laws and expanded background checks so you can see the narrowing getting even more narrow now background checks are not necessarily going to look like if they do wind up with some sort of agreement what the president would like to see but he's moving in the and staying out of it and there wasn't even press coverage of his meeting of with senator murphy just still photographers so again trying to keep a very low profile but he seems to be getting on side with whatever Senator Murphy is able to reach a compromise on. And that's significant because this is a president who has come into office as someone who's practical and just wants to get things done and pass bipartisan bills. Right. He hasn't really been able to do that in the way that he promised. And this would be something where he's not going to get what he wants, not by any stretch. He does not the assault weapons ban, not a ban on high capacity magazines and other things. But he could be narrowing in on these specific things and perhaps get those. Carol, that's well framed. You're right. It's exactly the sort of the premise his candidacy was built upon. Hey, he'll come in here. He knows how the process works. Mm -hmm. He'll back off and he'll he'll let them do what they do. We'll see if this uh, if this is one way to handle the bully pulpit. Uh, Garrett, hey, Carol Lee, thank you both. Uh, I now want to take this down to a more granular level here. Uh, Tushar Jones is the mayor of St. Louis, a city that has seen a dramatic decline in gun violence last year after recording its highest murder rate in 50 years in 2020. So, Mayor Jones, let's start with the positive. That's a big, dramatic drop. I imagine you don't believe it happened by accident. What are some of the programs that you believe uh, worked and could perhaps be extrapolated out to other cities? Well, thank you for having me, Chuck. Uh, some of the things that we're focused on in St. Louis uh, centered around deterrence, intervention, and prevention. Uh, we are using these methods to try to prevent crime but before it happens, to intervene where necessary with grassroots organizations, and deter people from lives, lives of crime uh, by giving them other options. Uh, and it's an all-hands-on-deck approach. We have relationships with the community, our community, we use data-driven policing strategies and alternatives to policing. So we have a cops and clinicians program that pairs licensed clinical social workers or other behavioral health providers with officers to intervene where necessary. To get the job done for you and what <laughs> the tools you need to continue these programs and to perhaps even uh, expand upon them, is this something where you need more help from the state more help from the feds, or is this something that the city and county ought to handle itself? Well, we have to get guns off our street, uh, period, stop. You know, there, that still um, makes, it, makes a difference in how successful we are in continuing our, our programs, because uh, the more our state uh, relaxes gun laws, and they have been since 2007, it also puts our officers in danger and it, it ties the hands of our of our uh, municipal officials. Uh, right now, we are challenging uh, the state of Missouri on the Second Amendment Preservation Act, which literally will charge our officers $50,000 per occurrence if someone says that they are, their Second Amendment rights were violated oh uh, when their gun was taken away. So, you know, we, we need action on the federal level and the state level, but no one wants to seem to do anything. What is the piece of gun legislation, practical gun legislation? One thing, and you, you pick it, I, I'm not going to plant any seeds here, that could have a big impact on the, on the streets of St. Louis. Oh, my. Getting rid of uh, high capacity weapons and weapons of war, I think, is a start mm -hmm. um, because everybody has access to an AR-15 um, and that's a weapon of war. Those, those should be used uh, uh, in war, not in everyday uh, circumstances. Uh, and I think if we can get rid of weapons of war off our street, that would be a, a huge step forward. It sounds like your police officers are telling you they feel outgunned at times. They absolutely do. I mean, uh, it, actually, you know, when people have access to the same weapons that our officers do, then then nobody is safe. And that's I mean, that that to me, you know, I hear this 
individually from police officers, but collectively you don't hear this as much. Um, is this something you wish more police officers would speak out saying, hey, you know, I, you know, look, I, I believe in the Second Amendment too. However, this is no way to keep a society uh, free uh, for a right to, as, as somebody wrote, uh, to pursue happiness. Right. The, the Second Amendment has, has been misinterpreted uh, in recent years to mean that everybody should have access to a gun. And there, and we all know that the Second Amendment, the, the, the reason the framers wrote that was because of uh, uh, to have a well-regulated militia. Uh, pe individual people are not a well-regulated militia. So uh, so it does, the Second Amendment does not mean that everybody should have access to firearms. And, you know, the background check issue is huge here, too, especially in issues of domestic violence. Um, and so we have to do something. I, 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 I am uh, cautiously optimistic that Congress will act. But unfortunately, we've seen this story before. Uh, I'm curious, school security, school safety. What is what is something specific that the feds could help you with? Well, they can take weapons out of uh, out of the hands of 18 year olds to have access to uh, weapons of war and, and be able to uh, purchase weapons at 18. I think they should raise the age back to 21. Uh, look, you know, cities and urban areas, uh, especially uh, schools where a majority of the children are black, already have uh, metal detectors and already have school officers already on on site. So uh, our children in, in urban areas are already going to school. Under uh, under a guise of going into a place that you know where the uh, the um, metal detectors go off every time somebody opens the door, and I'm sure that that traumatizes them as well. That's a it's a very fair point. Uh, you got some concrete asks. We'll see uh, how Congress responds. Uh, Mayor Char Jones, St. Louis, Missouri. Appreciate you coming on, sharing your perspective with us. Thank you for having me. Coming up. We've got the indictment charges uh, of the former leader of the Proud Boys and four other members with seditious conspiracy. What it means for the right-wing extremist group. Next, you're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. A federal grand jury in D.C. returned an indictment yesterday charging members of the Proud Boys, that far-right all-male group, and its leader, Enrique Tarrio, with seditious conspiracy. The indictment alleges that the five members were aware of discussions about a plan to storm the Capitol and to, quote, show our politicians we the people are in charge. The same five men were already facing charges of conspiracy to obstruct the certification of the 2020 presidential election. Now, if the charge of seditious conspiracy sounds familiar, that's because 11 members of the Oath Keepers, that's another far-right group, and its leader are also facing the same charges. So far, of the 11 Oath Keepers charged, three have pled guilty, which probably means at least one or more are cooperating. So for more on what all this means and what's next, I'm joined by our NBC News Justice reporter, Ryan Riley. And Ryan, I want to start first with just how organized the Proud Boys are as an organization. Uh, with Tario and, and the leaders all now under indictment and all facing these charges, is the organization itself essentially disbanding? Is it fracturing? Or are they staying behind their leaders trying to defend them? You know, it's largely retracted back to the local level. And in fact, there was a New York Times story about how much of an impact that the local branch in Miami has had on the Republican Party of Miami-Dade County. So mm -hmm. a lot of this is just going back to the local level. But this definitely has fractured the national organization because, of course, so many members of their leadership were in this chat and were involved in this. And when you have an indictment of this nature, of course, there's people who are cooperating and there are people who might be taking pleas earlier, and it just naturally fractures an entire organization. So that's a sort of a natural consequence uh, of this indictment that we've seen roll out in the past several months. Well, I, I don't want to presume anything, but it seems to me if we go from a basic conspiracy charge and have it uh, beefed up to seditious conspiracy, that seems to imply somebody's cooperating. They didn't just do this without more evidence. 
Right. And, you know, they were, they were, the Proud were careful about what they put in the written record. There was never like this, they never talked about it in extremely stark terms that, you know, we're going to invade the Capitol. There's only bits and pieces that come along. So I think that's why cooperators are really important here to say, no, this is the agreement. This is what we were all going to do because they were trying to communicate in these encrypted channels. There was efforts to erase messages. So the mm -hmm. full plan wasn't necessarily spelled out in a meeting as it's been in some of these other uh, conspiracy cases where it's just been really clear what was going to happen. The timing of these charges coming this week, the same week we're going to get our first, our sort of second look, if you will, at the January 6th committee, what they have found and what they have gotten. Uh, should we read into anything of the timing? Or is it coincidental? I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not sure. I think that, you know, the Justice Department obviously wants to send a message that they're taking this rather seriously. But, you know, the extent of this investigation is, I think, something that, re that bears repeating. Because right now we have over 800 charges, or 800 defendants, rather. But the total scope of individuals who either entered the Capitol or assaulted law enforcement officers outside is more than 2,500. So there's a very, very long road ahead. This is an overwhelming prosecution, one of the largest investigations in FBI history. DOJ is bringing in federal prosecutors from all over the country to help out with these cases. So there's this very, very big effort. And, you know, that's going to take a very long time. In this case, one of the reasons for the delay in the, uh, the initial indictment of the Proud Boys is because it took a very long time for the feds to actually crack Enrique uh, uh, Tario's cell phone because he was arrested the night before January 6th. And that it took them basically a year to get into that info. And that's what led uh, to this initial indictment. Ryan, though, when you look at the entire list of people that are indicted for seditious conspiracy and those that have been convicted, those that have pled guilty, they all look fairly on the lower end of the totem pole. I'm not going to say they were all on the low end of it. But there are the, I mean, it does feel as if there's a lot of lower level people paying steep prices. Are we expecting this to keep climbing the totem pole and more familiar names will start to pop up? I think we can expect to see something, you know, some more familiar names. Uh, I'm really interested in one call between uh, that has been laid out in court documents and one of and the members of the Oath Keepers actually testified to, where he talked about this effort by the head of the Oath Keepers to actually get in touch with Donald Trump on the evening of January 6th. That's something I'm really looking out for. And there is some overlap between some of the invest, between some of the physical effort to invade the Capitol and then the circles that were involved in this more legal effort. Right. Uh, or uh, through the legal process to basically try to get uh, the election uh, results overturned. You know, Ryan, you have, uh, you know, on January 5th and 6th, it seemed as if Roger Stone, Steve Bannon, were all sort of circulating with these folks. But has there been anything more than that? They were definitely in the same circles, right? Roger Stone was being protected by members of the Oath Keepers and was in communication with various folks. So I think that that's a really big component of it, but there hasn't been anything direct that we've seen thus far that has said, hey, let's all invade the Capitol. And it's really tough for prosecutors to dance around here. The select committee has a little bit more leeway than mm -hmm. the Justice Department does because the Justice Department can't just have an open-ended inquiry into yep. uh, to activities that are protected by the First Amendment. Ryan Riley, uh, justice reporter for us here at NBC News. Really appreciate you coming on and giving us more clarity there. Still ahead, a new warning from the United Nations. Climate change is moving exponentially, and policymakers have to do more. They have to do more now. But is anything going to happen? A former U.N. climate chief joins me next with a message to the world's governments. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Last week marked the 50-year anniversary of the U.N.'s first global climate summit. That took place in Stockholm, Sweden, in the half century since. Governments have repeatedly promised to take urgent action on climate. According to three former U.N. climate chiefs, those governments have failed to make good on, on them. In a recent editorial, the climate chiefs called out governments for not following through on climate initiatives and asked them to take action, warning that the impacts of inaction will only heighten an already devastated global set of global crises. They write, quote, the further climate change progresses, the more we lock in a future featuring more ruined harvests and more food insecurity, along with a host of other problems, including rises in sea level, threats to water security, drought, and decertification. Governments must act against climate change while also dealing with other pressing crises. Joining me now is former Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, Evo DeBoer. Mr. DeBoer, it's uh, good to have you here. My pleasure. So you wrote a pretty impassioned piece, along with uh, other former heads of this uh, climate 
action piece of the United Nations that it's taken on for decades. And I guess the way I would, I look at it and say, okay, so if the United Nations can't inspire collective action, who can and how do we do this? I'm not sure that it's up to the United Nations to inspire action. I think where the inspiration should come from is the evidence that the scientific community has been giving us with increasing certainty that um, climate change is an important issue and that we're close to a point where we might not have it under control anymore. So I think the persuasion needs to come from the science. That's one part of the story. The other part is I think that we all recognize that our models of, of economic growth need to change, that we need to move to a cleaner model of uh, a cleaner way of running our economies. So there's an economic and a scientific imperative, I think, to that. Hey, on one hand, what you say is very rational and it should be that should be easy to convene the powers that be to agree on, on that basic framework. But yet there's always something that gets in the way. Right. On climate issues in our country, it may be the cost of the transition. Right. In Europe, it's well, we're, we're in the middle. And, you know, there was nuclear energy. There's a lot of fear of that. And then sort of that set things back there. You've got the current war between Russia and Ukraine that is setting back some climate uh, goals and some activities. There's always an excuse. How do we get around the excuses? Um, I think there are two parts of that. I, first of all, we are seeing a certain amount of progress in the sense that over the past five years or so, the cost of wind and solar have come down by 70 percent. Um, we're making huge advances on battery technology, on, electronic, on ele electric vehicles. So we're seeing that renewable ways of doing business, of moving ourselves around, are beginning to make it into the market and becoming uh, competitive. So that's, that's great news. Um, the second part of the story, I think, is that around the world, there's a, a growing public consensus or growing public awareness that we need to come to grips with this issue. And if you look at a number of election campaigns, mm -hmm. including those in the U.S., in Canada, most recently Australia, you see that voters are asking for action on climate change and that politicians are beginning to take that seriously. No, look, Australia is an island nation. Islands uh, I think the island populations are more in tune with the idea of acting collectively in order to survive individually. In some ways, it's not surprising, and it, and it may foreshadow. Let me ask you this. Do we, are we too doom and gloom on the big picture? Because you talked about the incremental progress we have made. Do we need to actually set our goals to look more achievable for countries to get together and then it's sort of like, all right, hey, we did that baby step together. We were able to expand wind in, in a couple of parts of the world that we didn't know we could do that. You know, do we make the goals smaller in order to attain them? Well, I think baby goals might inspire babies, but I don't think they bring about the kind of, of transformations that, that we need. Um, I mean, I remember during my time in the climate change negotiations that what business was asking for above all was clarity, clarity in terms of where do governments want to go. And I think the business community will rise to any challenge. And if you give them a, a clear and inspiring target to work towards, mm -hmm. the business community will achieve that target. I think the largest challenge that we're going to face is some of the most powerful countries in the United, you know, in the leadership of the United Nations, and I'm referring most specifically to Russia, rely so much on fossil fuels for their own economy. And it seems that that makes this larger challenge that much harder. How do we deal with those big countries? The United States also has a lot of money that it makes in fossil fuels, too, collectively. How do we deal with that? Well, there's a large number of economies, not only that, that are producing huge quantities of fossil fuels, but a number of economies that are extremely reliant on, on fossil fuels at this moment in time. And I think that's a a reality that we need to work with in the context of, of a transition. Um, at the same time, you know, fossil fuels are not the only thing that we've run out of in history. I, I don't think the Stone Age ended because we ran out of stones. Um, you know, we, we make transitions, and that's what we humans are sometimes good at, sometimes not so good at. Uh, is the United Nations still the best place to try to do this collectively, or would the G20 be more realistic? 
I don't think you can really fix it in in, in one place. Um, I mean, to begin with, in, in the U.S. And, and perhaps to some extent in Canada, it's a discussion that needs to be had at home in terms of what are the advantages and disadvantages of acting uh, on climate change. I see the business community and business fora, like the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, talking about climate change and, and coming to grips with it. I see financial institutions getting together, uh, most recently, investors that account for 130 billion in in their portfolios saying we want to be carbon neutral by 2050 so it's it's not down to one forum i think we really need um all the all the platforms for for all of the constituents constituents to really come to a global solution eva deboer uh, a former head uh of of climate uh, action at the united nations really appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective with us my pleasure and thank you all for being with us this hour. We'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. Coverage will continue, though, right here with Hallie Jackson right after this break. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.